Hi everyone, Marco here from University of Oviedo. In the following, I will present a study on grain rotation recrystallization in olivine, the most common mineral in the lithosphere, made during my postdoctoral stage in Geoscience Montpellier in collaboration with Andrea and Fabrice, but also with uh, Walid Ben Ismail, who performed the rock deformation experiment of the rocks used uh, here at the University of Manchester quite some time ago. Our motivation for studying dynamic rock stylization processes in rocks are basically three. First, all major rock forming minerals easily undergo dynamic rock stylization during plastic deformation, and indeed, all rocks in highly strained plastic shear zones in the lithosphere show rock stylization, making it a very common and important phenomenon to understand rock deformation. Second, uh, dynamic rock stylization modifies the local dislocation content, the grain size, and the crystallographic preferred orientation of the rocks. All parameters that change its strength, establishing complex feedbacks during deformation. Uh, lastly, most numerical models simulating dislocation creep ignore dynamic rock stylization or implement it statistically. Uh, without simulating the process itself, because rectalization is not yet fully understood and therefore difficult to implement. With this, our original goal was to answer uh, these three questions using electron backscatter diffraction maps in experimentally deformed olivine rich rocks. But here, to keep this talk uh, short, I will focus on the first two how green cells form and how they evolve. All the electron backscatter diffraction maps I will show uh, here come from samples of peridotite deformed in axial extension. These olivine-rich rocks cylinders were deformed in a Patterson press under conditions where subgrain rotation rock stylization dominates in olivine uh, to extension of around 40-50%. The cylinders were directly core from natural uh, peridotites, which is quite unusual, and this means that the starting grain size is rather large, between 1 to 5 uh, millimeters, as you can see in the grain outline in the image. To preserve the microstructure, cylinders were quenched uh, rapidly after the formation, and um, well, if interested, uh, you can find more details of these experiments in the description of the video below. We made two types of orientation maps, large coverage map with step sizes in the order of tens of microns covering both the necking and the slightly strained areas, and high spatial resolution maps in recrystallized areas. Uh, with step sizes uh, between 1 to 3 microns, depending on the grain size. For all the maps, we performed the following protocol. First, uh, we define grain boundaries as those with a misorientation angle above 15 degrees, as is common in olivine. Then we segmented the recrystallized grains based on their grain orientation spread value, setting the threshold value at 2 degrees. Uh, here represented in blue. At the same time, we also segmented the structured grain into parent grains in yellow and relic grains in green, based on their apparent sectional areas. When the grain segmentation is done, we also proceed to segment the different grain boundary types into those that bring uh, the recrystallized material into contact, illustrated in green, those that bring the recrystallized and the substructure material into contact, that is uh, the recrystallization from here represented in orange, and some intragranular green boundaries in the substructure material in blue. Finally, we studied the contribution of different dislocation types in the subgrains. For this, we used the Panleon approach implemented in the MTEX toolbox. Briefly, this procedure searches for possible combination of these locations capable of producing the crystal lattice distortion that we measure with the EBSD and chooses the combination that produces the lowest strain energy. Due to this, it was necessary to define in advance the different sleep systems we expect to find in the material under study and their energies.
summarize it here in these sketches and this table. So let's start with the first sample. This is a detailed EBSD map showing two parallel living grains. The one at the top in yellowish uh, color is barely deformed because it is oriented in such a way that it is difficult to activate any of the weak olivine sliding systems, while the one with pink and purple colors is highly deformed with many subgrain uh, substructures and the whole area surrounding the grain in a higher orientation mostly uh, recrystallized. Now I want you to focus on a particular type of subgrains, the most typical ones in this grain, which are those that form closed loops and zigzag configurations parallel uh, to the extension. If uh, we zoom in on the zigzag subgrains, we observe the following features. First, they show a misorientation rotation axis that lies parallel to the olive B axis for any misorientation angle. And second, they consist almost exclusively on two edge dislocation system, the 100001 and the 001010, plus a small proportion of screw uh, dislocation with no traces of the other two edge types. The sketches here illustrate the geometry of the dominant edge dislocation in crystal coordinates. Note that both uh, have in common the same rotation axis parallel to the olive B axis but the teal or extra plane are perpendicular to each other. Curiously, when the grain wall traces lie perpendicular to the olivine A axis parallel to the steel plane, the 100001 dominates and when they are arranged perpendicular to the C axis, this is parallel to this plane here, uh, the 001010 dominates. It's the grain arranged oblique, for example uh, here, uh, both types have a roughly similar contribution. The situation with the closed loops of grains looks uh, pretty much the same as in the zigzags. Misorientation rotation axes lie parallel to the olive B axis and they mainly consist of these two edge dislocation types. Again, those grain walls perpendicular to A and C show corresponding peaks on 100001 and 001010 respectively. An observation I would like to stress here is that because rotation axes remain consistently parallel to the B-axis, our hypothesis is that the combination of these two edge types won't be able to generate a full closed three-dimensional subgrain cell. Theoretically, uh, to generate a closed cell, we will need other types of dislocation generating rotations in other directions. Here we see these two grain cells apparently close because the olive crystal has the B-axis perpendicular to the screen. Now let's zoom in at this other type of planar looking subgrain that run parallel to the C-axis. In these subgrains, the dominant system is systematically the 100010, which is the most common reported sleep system in olivine, deformed at high temperatures under dry conditions. There are contribution of other types as well, especially from the 100001 system. When this dislocation type dominates, the rotation axis usually lies parallel to the olivine C axis, consistent with the elements of this sketch, but commonly uh, varies between B and C due to the combination with other type of dislocations that have different rotation axes. Finally, in some maps, we observe some short grain segments dominated by the 00101 a 100 dislocation type, the missing one so far. In this case, these segments show a rotation axis around the olivine A axis. Following this sketch here, and indicated by the arrows in the IPFs. To recap on the grain, most are formed by a combination of these two dislocation types, illustrated in green, that produce rotations parallel to the olivine B axis. The 100010 type 
is also quite common, particularly in combination with 100001 to form long straight subgrain traces perpendicular to the C-axis. This uh, produces rotation of the crystal lattice from the C to the V-axis, commonly known in olivine as pencil glide, and less frequently subgrain traces formed by the system 001010 with a rotation axis parallel to the olivine a-axis. When plotting the rotation axis of all the subgrains for a complete map, the inverse pole figures look like this one in the bottom right corner, with a maximum at B, very often a submaximum around C, and only in some maps a third local maximum in A. Now let's move quickly from subgrain to grain boundaries. In this case, the most relevant information was the analysis of the misorientation rotation axis. Here I illustrate six different regions of interest in two different samples in which we analyzed separately the population of rotation axis in the subgrains and two, grain, uh, two types of grain boundaries, the recrystallization from and the grain boundaries between recrystallized grains. As expected, the subgrains show maxima on the B-axis and a submaxima on the C-axis. In contrast to this, green boundaries developed many other local maxima difficult to systematize. Some still show some inheritance from subgrains, but the randomization of the misorientation rotation axis is clearly there. This sharp transition in the misorientation axis from subgrain to green boundaries has already been observed in the past in other rock forming mineral phases such as calcite, dolomite, or quartz. Indeed, here I highlight a quote from a review on subgrain rotation recrystallization in which they indicate this very thing. So far, this sharp transition has been interpreted as a shift towards the coexistence of two deformation mechanisms dislocation creep and grain boundary sliding. For example, in this sketch from Bessman and Pryor in Calcite, they interpret that when the subgrain turns into a grain boundary, it becomes a surface capable of sliding. And this will be the cause of the random reorientation of the rotation axis. We tested this hypothesis against our data and found the following. In this sample at the bottom, where we have three types of segmented grain boundaries, the randomization of the rotation axis compared to the subgrains is clear in all of them. In the case of the recrystallized grains, here in blue, it seems fair to think that grain rotation may be partially accommodated by grain boundary sliding, as the shape of the grains is almost equidimensional. Uh, however, the randomization is also clear along the recrystallization front and the intragranular green boundaries, which are in some cases very regular or show very elongated shapes, uh, making rotations and more specifically green boundary sliding very difficult to justify without creating major incompatibilities during the formation. So it seems that green boundary sliding is not a prerequisite uh, to generate this randomization of the rotation axis. So, to conclude, we documented the formation of subgrain cells in olivine during subgrain rotation recrystallization and found that there is a strong crystallographic control and that under current experimental condition, the activation of at least uh, three different sliding systems is needed to form three-dimensional closed subgrain cells. This implies uh, the activation of hard slip system in olivine and therefore local high stresses. This agrees well with common knowledge as a subgrain rotation recrystallization in nature dominates in the low temperature high stress uh, regimes. We also documented a sharp transition from subgrains to grain boundaries, but our hypothesis to explain this transition uh, rather than grain boundary sliding is that the grain boundaries once formed acts as barrier to a slit transfer uh, creating and accumulating new types of defects such as dislocation with different border vectors 
for uh, green boundary specific uh, defects such as disclinations. As for disclinations, they have already been observed along olivine grain boundaries in these studies uh, seated here. Thanks a lot for watching.